I have the great pleasure of having with me here today Dr. Myron Cohen, who is Chief of Infectious Diseases at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Let me start, uh, Dr. Cohen, by welcoming you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. Perhaps we could start with a, a general overview of your area of expertise, which is HIV transmission. Perhaps you could start by describing to us why it's important to study HIV transmission kinetics. Mm -hmm. uh, the epidemic is entirely fueled by transmission. Um, and there's, uh, we know the roots completely. There's only a few ways that HIV is transmitted. And so understanding the mixture of biology and epidemiology and behavior mm -hmm. uh, of transmission is critical to every prevention effort. And what is a good way to analyze transmission? Is it at the level of the transmission kinetics between two people or perhaps the impact at a population level? Mm -hmm. I, I think we have no choice but to study both. Um, of course, every transmission event depends on uh, human interaction um, through the uh, exposures that we know so well. But beyond that, um, the goal is to reduce uh, population uh, incidence and prevalence of HIV. So these kinds of studies are done concomitantly, studying individuals, especially couples, mm -hmm. and then studying whole populations uh, who are being subjected to prevention efforts. But the transmission biology, of course, depends on the study of couples. So let's stick with that. There's interesting data historically from Tom, Tom Quinn's group at Johns Hopkins in serodiscordant couples in Uganda, I believe. Could you tell us a little bit about um, one, why we're looking at that? What can we learn from studying transmission in serodiscordant couples? And also historically, where have we arrived with our knowledge on that? Okay. Um, the, the, the study that Quinn did wasn't really a study of couples. This is often misunderstood. It was a study of a very large population in which they knew the names of the people who had acquired HIV over periods of time, and um, they also knew the um, partnerships, the sexual partnerships that had transpired within that community. <coughs> there was no drug use in that community, mm -hmm. so all the HIV transmission could be ascribed to sexual relationships. Mm -hmm. So they retrospectively made couples. And at yeah. first, and what's interesting about it is the retrospective couples lacked complete fidelity. That is, people said that they had acquired HIV from a respondent, from somebody they identified, but when the virus itself was examined, 10% or more of, of the acquisitions did not come from the named partner. They came from some other person in the community. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. So if you have so when we then, so the, the first issue is that the Tom study uh, from Rakai, it's the Johns Hopkins University study, that was really not about couples, it was about a community. Right. But, but the data that they collected mm -hmm. demonstrated the power of some things you could learn from couples. Then we can kind of reduce our description of um, HIV to three different relationships. There are two people in a sexual relationship and both are HIV negative, they're concordant negative. Mm -hmm. Should they remain in an absolute monogamous relationship and mm -hmm. no third person ever enters, mm -hmm. they, that couple will remain HIV negative for life, at mm -hmm. least from a sexual point of view. Mm -hmm. um, a, another kind of couple would be concordant positive. Right. Um, now, Where they're both positive. Both positive. And there's a huge misconception, especially in Africa, that if one person tests positive, that their sexual partner with whom they've lived for months or years will automatically be positive as well. This right. leads to a great misunderstanding uh, within that partnership because only about half of those partnerships had le have led to a sexual transmission event. Mm -hmm. So about half of the index cases that have a partner have a negative partner. So an opportunity for prevention is very strong in that arena. Now the, the thing we're discussing for studying the biology of transmission and prevention events to some extent are discordant relationships. Mm -hmm. One partner positive, the other negative, whether it's a man or a woman, in right. either direction. The, the strength of that is that you can control to a great extent, you can understand a great deal about the behaviors mm -hmm. and the virus of the, uh, uh, in, within the couple. But there's a, a disadvantage as well. First of all, the couples who are discordant are highly selected because transmission events didn't occur. So for a variety of reasons that we don't completely understand, they're selected to not transmit HIV. And second, if you're going to study couples, you have an absolute moral obligation. Even if you're interested in transmission and you're studying them prospectively to understand transmission, you have a massive moral obligation to prevent the transmission event. So you're working against yourself in the study. You're automatically saying, if there is a transmission event, I've done a terrible job as a clinician or public health person. And so these are very difficult studies. Having said that, 
um, there are oh, anywhere from seven to ten large studies of discord in couples examining many different things. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that either of the partner could be positive. Are we learning anything about gender, biology, and transmission kinetics? <clears throat> um, truthfully, not as much as you would think. Okay. Um, that at, at this point, it's very hard for us to call out the probability of a transmission event in either direction. Now, I, I need to preface my comments. The last couple of years, with a lot of investment in... in um, from the NIH and from other uh, funding organizations, we're learning a lot about the virus, the mm -hmm. transmitted virus. And there's considerable debate about um, whether the transmission event as it relates to the virus is exactly the same in men and women or in discordant gay couples mm -hmm. where, uh, and two men. Mm -hmm. Two women very, very rarely have a transmission event, but right. two men would have a transmission event. And there's a fair amount of research going on in that area, but not enough to say anything intelligent. And of course the interesting development, as you've um, inferred, is the initial studies were on people who weren't on therapy. Of course the evolution now is with scale up of therapy, more and more people, even in Africa, are on therapy. Right. So what's happening with transmission while people are on therapy, right. and are there lessons for the developed world that we can extrapolate from that? Mm -hmm. um, I think this brings us back to kind of inductive and deductive logic mm -hmm. and clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So there is a very strong belief, and I think rightly so, that the one thing that we know is that the concentration of virus helps to predict the probability of a transmission event. Mm -hmm. Now, the surrogate that's been used is blood, is virus in blood, the concentration of virus in blood. But surely that's a surrogate for the concentration of virus in genital secretions. Right. But that's almost never measured uh, because it's difficult, you know, it's just difficult to get those mm -hmm. secretions. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly very rarely measured at the time of a transmission event or even anywhere near a transmission event. So, and we also know from uh, compartment studies that there's actually a poor correlation between mm -hmm. blood and genital secretions, whether mm -hmm. they're male or female. So our first problem is that we know that the concentration in blood seems to predict transmission probability very well, but we don't really understand exactly how that relates to genital secretions. Now, having said that, the Quinn, Tom Quinn study that we talked about earlier, it seemed to demonstrate that when the vir virus concentration was high within a discordant partnership, that the transmission event became much more probable. About 40% of all their transmission events occurred with viral copy number in blood greater than 40,000 copies. Mm -hmm. They observed no transmission events when the copy number in blood was below 1,000 copies or 1,500 copies. This led, and other studies have supported that idea. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty firmly rooted. <clears throat> now, having said that, inductively, you would think if we suppress the virus in your blood mm -hmm. with an antiviral, it must be true that you'll be less likely to transmit to your sexual partner and that we might be able to help, at least in part, to treat our way out of part of the epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, there's a couple of problems with this, uh, one of which is that not all the antivirals achieve the appropriate concentrations in general secretions. That's the first problem. Second, right. we know for sure that people on antiviral therapy intermittently break through their therapy and shed HIV for a variety of reasons. Sometimes there's an inflammatory process in the genital tract, mm -hmm. like a sex an other sexually transmitted disease. Mm -hmm. Other factors we don't understand lead to this kind of intermittent shedding, imperfect intermittent shedding. So we're really unsure. We, we have strong biological plausibility that antivirals will stop transmission but we're a little bit unsure of the power of the intervention. Okay. Then the next issue is observational trials. Mm -hmm. So we have observational trials going on with discordant couples where the index case, the infected person, is put on treatment because they need it for their health, mm -hmm. and then the couple is followed and compared to historical events. Mm -hmm. And the observational trials have come to Rwanda and Zambia, mm -hmm. and those observational trials strongly support, and, and uh, another trial in uh, Uganda, mm -hmm. and those three trials uh, strongly support the idea that the treated person is rendered much less infectious, mm -hmm. but maybe not completely non-infectious. So, and also we don't know the durability of the, the antiviral therapy. Um, okay. So this leads to a clinical trial that I think you know about, um, uh, called, uh, run by the NIH, done a multinational clinical trial, trying to look prospectively at discordant partners for five years to see whether the intervention gives durable, sustainable prevention of transmission events. 